This happened about nine years ago. I was living with a roommate at the time in a townhouse in a suburb of Denver. My boyfriend at the time had always been kind of abusive, with the occasional slap or pinning me down on the floor, but after a family member that was close to him ended their own life, he really lost it. My ex, Pierce, just sort of lost it in the middle of an argument one day about a week after the funeral and threw me on the ground, hit my arm over and over, until there was a giant bruise on one shoulder and a handprint shaped bruise on the other. My face also ended up being pretty swollen and I also had a bloody lip. My roommate called the police and he ended up being arrested and a no contact order was put in place. He was also ordered to go to counselling and maybe drug or alcohol meetings, even though at the time he didn't use. Fast forward a few months though, I'm living with this roommate because I was completely financially dependent upon him. She's taken it upon herself to pay for me to get my GED. That woman is honestly a saint. And a lot of my time was spent on studying for the subjects. After everything, I was very agoraphobic, but I even managed to forge some online friendships and maybe even something more with a genuinely kind guy. Now one day, Pierce's grandmother stopped by to take me to pay my phone bill. She lived close by in the same townhouse complex and was more or less right behind where I lived. I remember it being the first beautiful and slightly warm day after a long winter, so I opened all the blinds to let the sunlight in and left them open when I left. And after paying my phone bill, Pierce started calling her. I wasn't too concerned because I knew that he was supposed to be at his court-mandated counselling shortly anyway. I couldn't hear what he was saying, but his grandmother told him that we had just stopped at the McDonald's. Again, not an issue at this point. I continued to eat until maybe three minutes later when Pierce calls again. His grandma tells me that she's probably going to be home in about ten minutes. The call ends... I finish my food and we leave. Again in the car as I'm maybe two minutes away from where I live now, Pierce calls again. I still can't hear his side of the conversation but his grandma tells him the intersection we had just passed and suddenly I have this terrible sinking feeling in my stomach. I know that something is wrong and I just can't identify what it was but I know in my heart of hearts that something is up. I considered asking his grandma for help, but for context, his grandmother, on multiple occasions, watched Pierce hit me or try to strangle me even, and openly expressed disgust at how I can't help but just get him angry. Anyway, his grandma pulls in front of where I live, and I noticed that all of the blinds I had opened are now closed. We go inside, and once she leaves, I walk upstairs to my room, and see a random Word document open on my computer. Pierce has written a whole long page worth of stuff, but I only pay attention to the big words at the top. It said, I read your emails. Immediately too, I, I just know that he's seen the emails between me and the guy that I'd met. And even though they weren't outright uh, sexual or flirty or anything, you could kind of tell that there was something there. My brain stopped reading at this point and I needed to figure out if he's still in this building because there is no contact order and I know that he would have come in through the back door so nobody would see him. My mind latches on to this idea that if the back door is locked, he's probably gone. I run downstairs to the door and see that it's locked. But as soon as I reach the door, I hear a closet sliding open from the room that I was just in loud and angry footsteps, and he's yelling my name. Now, I know that this may sound weird, but I really can't call the exact details of what happened next. I remember his face in mind before I could understand what was happening. I remember being back up in that room again. I think to go through all of my emails with him, and I remember him slapping me hard in the face, over and over, until I just got dizzy. I remember somehow convincing him to let me use the phone to respond to one of the roommate's texts or something like that. I don't remember what I said, but I remember that she called right away. I remember Pierce standing two feet away from me and looking at me, believing that he was about to kill me, and my roommate asking me, are you safe? I only said no, and she told me that she was on her way and would be there as fast as she could. 
Eventually, Pierce became convinced that I had called the police and with a knife in his hands, told me that if they were coming anyway, that he might as well give me what I deserve. I managed to convince him that I didn't call the police and then he started crying about what a terrible person he was and threatened to end his own life. So with a handprint on my swollen face, I tried to convince him that he wasn't terrible and to please not do this until my roommate came home. In the end, he left and I moved states, had my name changed and I only feel safe in buildings in big cities where I'm at least three stories up now. It was a crazy time, and I really don't wish it on anyone. So about three years ago, my mum and I were living in a one-bedroom apartment. We didn't really have any money, and it was the only place that we could afford. It was a super old Victorian home in Tacoma, WA, that had been sectioned off into four different little apartments. Since I was a kid, I have always been super sensitive to, well, energies, I guess you would call them. Whether it's people or a place, if there's some type of a, a negativity, I can sort of sense it. When we first moved in there too, I immediately felt weird. I wouldn't say that I felt anything evil there, but the place just felt really off. Anyway... A couple of months in, I went to spend the night at my boyfriend's place, which wasn't something that I did often. About 9.30, I got a call from my mum. Mind you, at the time she was 63. I picked up and could immediately tell that she was really upset. She asked me if I was at my boyfriend's and if I was okay. I told her yes, that I'm perfectly fine, and she then explained to me that she'd gone to lay down to go to sleep when she heard my voice yell her name. At first, I sort of doubted it and thought that maybe she'd had a bad dream, but she was so sure that she hadn't even been laying down more than a minute, still wide awake, and then it was like I was right in the doorway yelling mama. We both tried to forget about it, to be honest, but my mum was convinced that something was there in our apartment that was trying to scare her. A week later, she had gotten some Palo Santos to try cleansing the apartment, she again did this while I was out, but she called me scared, begging me to come home. When I got back, she explained that she had done the usual starting from the front door, going through the living room to the bed and the bath, then the kitchen, working her way front to back. She said that she came to walk back into the living room where we had this little table and chairs, and her chair was pulled out from the table, tilted back, balancing on its back legs. I tried reassuring her that, that we would start looking for a new place, but it wasn't going to happen fast because of our money problems. And it was about maybe a month after that that I was on the couch while she was cutting vegetables for dinner and I heard her scream. I ran into the kitchen and she said that she had placed the knife down on the cutting board, turned around to the sink to grab another vegetable and when she turned back, the knife was gone. She said that she turned back to the sink and was checking the counters, but it wasn't there, so she opened up the drawer to get another knife, and when she turned back to the cutting board, it was there again. Well, we left the next day to stay with a friend for a while, but this was the most scared that I'd ever seen my mum, and I know it wasn't because she was losing it or just getting old. She was still very lucid. I still believe that if we had stayed there, that something bad would have happened to her, or maybe even to me. So for context, I'm a 22-year-old male, and I live in a large city in the Midwest. Now, I drive for Lyft while putting myself through trade school. I drive for other similar companies, but that's beside the point. I have many other stories from them as well, but this is the one that I would like to share. So, it was Christmas Eve 2020. I was out running Lyft for a few hours before heading to my mum's with my new baby and wife. Nothing special going on for the night really, just the usual pretty much. I get a ride request. It was a pickup from this kind of lower income apartment complex. No big deal. 
I arrive and I find my passenger. He has all of his belongings. Several boxes of stuff, in fact. My car is a 2006 Chevy Impala, so it's not too big. But we managed to get all of his stuff loaded up, just barely, and we're on our way. During the ride, he's crying, saying that his girlfriend was cheating on him and had walked in on them earlier that night. He couldn't stay there because it was her name on the lease, so I was taking him to a hotel, apparently. Now, in my city, we have a street that is well known for having vices, hookers, drugs, gangs, weapons, and just shady motels, the works. We get to the motel, and he asks me to wait for him to check in and get his key. No problem, man, I say. I'll confess, though, that I break the rules a little when it comes to Lyft. But I do have a gun hidden in a concealed holster secured to the underside of my driver's seat for protection. Reason being... Driving Lyft and other contract apps, I've had knives and guns pulled on me as well as people have tried to fight me, rob me and all kinds of other things, but like I said, another time. This motel was on that street that I mentioned before though. Homeless people were everywhere. There was a dude on the far corner of the complex that still had a needle in his arm, passed out against the building and I'm a big fan of true crime and all and horror narration. So, I'm definitely on edge. He gets his key though, and the whole motel is ground level, so to help this guy out, I drive to his door. As I mentioned before, he had a lot of stuff too, so I started to help him unload his stuff. But while on my second trip getting all that, I saw a guy come out of the room just to the south of my car, followed by two ladies. They came up to the room that I was next to, not my passenger, one of the ladies pounded on the door and then opened it. That's when I saw this guy raise a shotgun up out of his long coat and storm into the room. The two ladies followed him, slamming the door behind them. And in the following, I heard a lot of yelling and shouting. I was just waiting for shots to ring out. When out of nowhere, my passenger came up behind me. I can take this, man. Go ahead and take off. Have a Merry Christmas and he gave me a cash tip. I didn't even notice that he took the boxes out of my hands or slid a $5 bill in my pocket because I was just completely frozen to be honest. I knew that they may have been going down into that room but I had to leave or at least get to where I could get my gun. I know the guy and both the ladies saw me and I know that they knew that I saw the gun. I had to get out of there though. You know, no witnesses and all that. So I got in my car and I just sped away quickly. I got a block or so away I think and then I sat down for a second and just called the cops. I gave them every detail that I could and after I got off the phone with the police I signed out of Lyft. I didn't have much money but I was done. I got a call later that night. The cops apparently investigated they never found the gunman or the women and they never answered the door that I saw them come out of. And the occupants of the room they went into said that nothing had happened and that I was just making everything up. Well, I know what I saw. In February of 2012, I went to visit my grandfather's grave for his birthday. His death was really a hard thing for me to deal with, as he had died in March of 2011 and was still very fresh to me. I was kneeling in front of his grave with my head down, mourning and crying, when my body went into full dangerous close-by mode. I looked up to see a man running full sprint from the woods surrounding the cemetery and force myself to get into my truck as quickly as possible without the man getting close to me. By the time that I had made it to my truck, he had gotten about 50 feet from me. I jumped in and locked the door, much to his apparent displeasure. He threw his hands up in a huff like his favorite team had just lost a football game. I started the truck and started to drive out as fast as I could, but not before driving right past him. I didn't break eye contact for a second, and neither did he, so I got a really good look at this guy's face cut to a few years later and I'm at work bored and decided to download an app that had a ton of paranormal, cryptid, serial killer and UFO articles. 
And as I was browsing through the serial killers, I came across one that made my heart drop. Israel Kais. It's a horrible story and you can look him up for more information if you would like. But apparently he would bury things like kits in places long before he ever committed the crimes in sort of a way to prepare for things. And I often think back to that day when he chased me through the graveyard like that. And I wonder if there was a kit buried in those woods.